Hey everyone, Widowmaker part four. So let's talk about the motor mount design, let's talk about the oil filler cap, and let's talk about a neat trick I learned with alcohol. And then, uh, then we're going to drop the engine, we're going to talk some more about the exhaust fitment, it, you know, we'll get a better view with that out. Um, we're going to talk about the AC compressor fitment a little bit more, and then, uh, then we'll pull the transmission off and we'll take that apart, and that's going to be the big thing today. So all the work that we're going to have to do inside the transmission, and uh, put it back together, maybe even put it back in the car today. I don't know, we'll see. Let's get to it. So, as you can see right here, I'm currently 3D printing the motor mount skeleton. Um, I couldn't quite get the design to where I was happy with it on the screen, and I figured I'd just print out a skeleton so I can kind of slap some clay on there, get the exact shape that I want, and then go see about putting that into the computer. So, uh, we'll be working on that a little bit later today. But first, let's, let's just get an easy win. So, this is a Mishimoto oil cap for this car. Um, well, for this engine, not this car. Um, and... Well, yeah, let's go to the engine bay. All right, so if we remember this problem here, the factory oil cap just kind of, oh, yeah, okay. It actually kind of goes in, but we can't rotate it. And, you know, I'm not even sure if I'm going to use that to actually fill the motor yet. It might just be a cap that we're looking for there. Uh, but we can't really cut this down because it's actually hollow. So even if we cut the top off of this and we just put it on with a, you know, a wrench of some kind, there'd be a hole. So I found this uh, Mishimoto unit, which unfortunately I was, I was really hoping for an easy win here that would be able to just put it on and screw it on. Uh, it's not going to be that simple, but we can just cut this down a little bit. Uh, this is not hollow, so we'll, uh, We'll just go take it to the lathe. But again, you know, with this project, I'm using a lathe because I have a lathe. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from going at this with a hacksaw, a sawzall, and belt sander. We're just going to make this a low profile cap. Close enough for this application. That'll work. Just kind of clean off these edges here and let's go try it. Put the o-ring back on and let's see if it works. All right it's simple but you know what we came out to the shop and we got a win today so if nothing else we at least got that. So what we're gonna do next um, I'm gonna mark on the firewall where the exhaust hits right now. Um, I'm not gonna take you under there with a the camera uh, but then we're going to drop the motor out and take a look at that. All right, and while it's convenient, let's check our compressor. So first we're going to get our alignment. And obviously this is just rough, right? It's hanging from an engine hoist right now. We're going to align it. Okay. There's our base alignment. And sorry, this one won't uh, make the noise. Maybe I should upgrade. So I have measuring equipment and whatnot to uh, check, but the nice thing about a belt is the belt really wants to stay flat. So. If you go to one side or another, you can visibly see that it wants to bend. So you can kind of eyeball the center and yeah. Yeah, I'd say the pulley right now is probably about 20 thousandths too far out, uh, which means it would track correctly. So we might actually use this position and there's probably 20 thousandths worth of slop in that bolt position right there. So if we set it further back, I bet it would handle, but it, anyways, 20,000, no big deal. Um, it's also probably, uh, okay, well, it's not adjustable there, but I was hoping there was a shim there. But anyways, so that bolt right there, that's super convenient. That actually puts our compressor at their correct place. Um, I'm pretty sure the alternator would clear, but let me grab one. All right, wow. It really couldn't get any closer. Um, 
frankly, I can measure that distance with some feeler gauges. Um, needless to say, you might have to shave the casting right there, but that's a good position. Um, let me move you guys to this position here. And if you look at it from this angle, you can see the uh, crank position sensor down there. It's got more than enough space. So the only potential issue here, well, it's not just potential issue. I'm pretty sure it is a real issue is we've got this bracket here is normally supposed to go in here. So actually let's go ahead and take that off. We might be able to, let's take a look. Okay. So I'm seeing a couple interesting things here. First of all, these three holes actually almost line up with these three holes. The spacing here is maybe one or two millimeters bigger. Um, but if we line it up that way, you can see based on here, right? We're, we're eight millimeters too far forward, give or take, maybe five. And if we put it in here, there's a couple things that happen. First, uh, right here interferes on the casting here, but that can be shaved off. Um, and really interestingly, at the bottom, the bolts look like they would clear if there was like a specialty toe clamp kind of bracket at the bottom, we'd pick up three bolts right away. So essentially this needs to be shaved off here. Special toe clamp needs to be made for here. And then this bolt used as is, and it's good. Um, the only thing is that's only three bolts. I'd really like to get a fourth one in there. I don't know, maybe we can pick up on this alternator bolt or something. Either way, this ain't gonna be that bad. So let's go take a look at the engine bay. All right, so this mark right here is what I did when the engine was in the car. Essentially, well, you can see the mark right here. It's center line right there. This, and it was pretty much touching. So this is where that front bank wants to sit. Now, there's a couple problems with that. Um, first is this coolant pipe here this is going to want to go up to about here. Um, there's a few ways around that. You know, we could actually hard line from here to here because this is more or less rigid here. That's a, a very, very tight rubber coupler there. Um, the motor is going to rock around that. So it would only ever go in and out. Like if the coupler here was three, four inches long, that would be more than good enough. It's kind of nice there. It avoids the fuel line. Um, we'll still need some heat shielding here, right? Because it's, it's kind of close. Um, actually, honestly, that's not bad at all. I'll, I'll put some heat shielding, but that's not bad at all. Um, but let's see. So that place is, so if we put that, uh, marking that center bolt position there. Um, so if we go here. Yeah, so with this one, right, we've got one of these things is, is we can't have those things share the same space. So that's not, and then that's affecting the shift cables and everything. Man, it's definitely a rock in a hard place. If we go here, we've got this to contend with, but this is, I mean, it's a line going that way. And then it squiggles here for the sake of this guy here and goes back down, right? So we could, we could go around that. That's not a big deal. And in the race car, I just put a shield around this thing. I don't know. Looking at this, there's a lot of space here on the engine. So I think I'm tempted gonna have to make something custom and you know go down about here and get close to the engine take this fuel line here relocate it a little bit with some appropriate shielding I think it's good but I think yeah I think we're gonna need something custom uh, for the people that don't want to do something custom I think this here is gonna be your best bet um, and just make this hole a little bit bigger so that you can go in there, have a shield. Um, well, say a little bit bigger, like you're, 
if you're going to do it that way, right, your opening is probably going to be something like this. Um, and then you can just make your make your cover right there. Yeah, all right. I mean, there was bound to be some hiccups, right? We're trying to put a V6, a pretty big V6 of that in the engine, in an engine bay that's, you know, just a little bit bigger than a K-car engine bay. Hmm. So now I'm going to take a minute to share a trick that I just learned this week, actually. Um, we were talking about boots and how the grease was coming out right here. No matter how tight you tighten this clamp, and um, yeah, this is an inner, but it does it on the outer also. Um, these clamps here, they're really the tightest kind of clamps you can get. So I got, so I got to talking with a friend, and he mentioned that there's probably something in the lubricant that the manufacturer uses to install these. And, you know, when you're removing a factory hose, it's always extra sticky. And honestly, I never really thought about that too much. I always assumed that it was just because the car's been together for 15 or 20 years, because of the kind of vehicles I work on. But conveniently, uh, there was actually a brand new car in the driveway. It wasn't mine, but uh, there was a brand new car in the driveway just after I heard that. And I went out and it was like the car was eight months old. Um, and I went and I went and tried to pull a hose off and it had the same thing. It looked like it was on there for 20 years. So that got me thinking, it's like, well, you know, there's no residue on there. What's the factory doing to make these things stick so well? You know, when, as far as lubricant goes, you know, my favorite one here is a silicone lubricant. I'll also reach for WD-40 to just help put these hoses on, especially if they're being, you know, annoying at all but check this out so this is what i use for washing my 3d prints but all it is is just isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol so i went ahead and reached out to one of my contacts that actually works at toyota and i asked what they used and you know he he actually interestingly he said he thinks they use rubbing alcohol just the cheapest stuff they can get but he would confirm for me, and sure enough, a few hours later, he confirmed that's what they use. So, check this out. I, I never thought about doing this, but a little bit of alcohol on both ends. You know, obviously, if the end's not mobile, you just use a towel. But this stuff makes the hoses slip on. Honestly, it's a really good lubricant. But we're going to leave this sit here, and then, actually... The other thing we're going to do here is we're going to dry this one. And we're going to do that one like I used to do it. Just kind of put a little shield in the way there. A little bit of lubricant. Yeah. There you go. And then just slip it on. And, you know... That goes on. Honestly, that didn't go on as easily as this one did. But we're going to do that. Now, the other thing, I actually have tried this off of camera, and it works beautifully. What I haven't tried, though, is what happens if I put it on a joint? Is it going to make it stick just well enough that it's going to stop the grease from coming out? Now, I won't be able to fully test that, but let's put it on and see if it's sticky. So, and that is a used joint. You can see there's grease in there, but I went ahead and cleaned really carefully the top. And sure enough, makes the boot easier to install. Let me put a clamp on that, and uh, we're going to let it sit for a bit. And here we are, actually, a couple days later, because things just got in the way. Um, anyways. Okay, so yeah, so this is the silicone one. So, see, things got, you know tighter but it's still slippery and then if we do this see this one doesn't it's even more than if it was if I had just put it on there dry it's actually stuck on there <coughs> yeah yeah I can't now of course if I grab it and twist it There we go. So, needless to say, yeah, 
isopropyl alcohol, that's the key. And then once you put it back on, you know, even if I had left this for a couple days, see, it will come back off easier for some reason. If it's wet when it's assembled, there, I don't know, maybe one of you guys in the audience can tell me what's going on, but um, it seems to stick just a little bit better if it's wet when you put it together. Let's see. The reason I really care is for the CV. Now, if I look in here, I can, it probably doesn't come off on camera, I can kind of see that it's still partially wet. So this is probably not going to work, but there's only one way to find out. So, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it looks mostly dry. I don't know. Yeah, I can see, like right here, it's still very much wet. Um, tell you what, I'm actually going to put this back together off camera, and I'm going to try drying it. Um, it's, you know, I'm wearing long sleeves today. It's, it's actually gotten cold out here, so maybe that's the problem. I don't know. More exploration to do here. But either way, isopropyl alcohol for hoses is a fantastic idea. I'm definitely going to do that going forward. All right, back to where we were. All right, and the next thing that I think you guys will be thrilled to see progress in is this motor mount. So you'll remember we started with this, which is just the, uh, uh, the stock torque mount with this little thing made on here to pick up the point. And what that allowed me to do is then measure the distance between these surfaces and this one here to be able to then make this model here in CAD. Now this only has all the position relative to each other and then printed this thing. And then with this, I just used some modeling clay on top of it uh, to kind of get an idea what I wanted to feel like. Now this did get mangled a little bit. Uh, kind of give me an idea from there that gave me a much better idea what I was looking for. And I made this guy. Now, this thing here, you'll notice I had to, well, actually you can't quite see it. I had to cut a whole bunch of it off because the problem is this water neck here, you know, these mounts are all recessed and we have to clear all of this. So what I did is I, I, I made this mount to where I thought it would clear everything and it, it didn't, but that's not a big deal. So then I took it, I filled it with clay and then, you know, gently kind of screwed it down. Um, you got to be careful. This stuff's not super, super strong. But kind of made the general shape, then screwed it down, and then took that back to the drawing board to make another revision, which just finished printing this morning, which is this guy. And now you'll notice in the back it's nice and hollow. And this thing, once made in aluminum, will be about two pounds, which is pretty good. That fits everywhere and then the other change that I did is the bolt holes that it the bolts that it uses are all the factory length bolts so I won't have to supply bolts with this which is good because these bolts here are 115 millimeters long which is kind of a difficult size to get um, unless you buy them from Toyota Come on. And, and then according to the computer in this direction right here it'll hold about 1200 pounds uh, once it's in aluminum, of course, um, without going into the plastic deformation, it should only bend up, you know, a tenth of an inch or so at 1,200 pounds, which is great. That meets all my design criteria, actually beats them by a little bit. So I'm really happy with this design. Um, this one, I did have to make just a few minor changes on the inside. So I got to make one more model, print that out, make sure it fits. Now, something that's important to note here is these ejection pin marks I have seen two of these water castings and they have moved around a little bit. Um, at, well, as well as I've seen a third one that didn't have any of these, so I'm not sure how they ejected it from the mold. Um, so since this is going to be cast and this is going to be cast, there is a chance that a little bit of shaving has to go on. You know, the, the problem is you want this as close as possible for the, the sake of the strength of the mount and that's kind of just where we end up. now. It feels that this is being fairly forward. Something I do want to show you guys is if we take the RAV4 mount, you can see, you know, it looks like it's right there, but if you look at this, it actually, it actually supports the engine from 
about the same location. It's actually just about 10 millimeters further forward. So it ends up hanging it pretty much where the factory hung it, at least in one application. So I feel pretty good about that. I just want to cover something for you guys that want to do a DIY thing. Um, you know, there's this thing here that I made at the beginning, and there's nothing wrong with this, but I do want to cover something if you do that. Uh, Toyota made two mounts to go with this thing. And there's this thing, which you're going to see on most of the application, and this guy here, which is the RAV4. And you can see the bolt holes here are in a triangle shape, which is much better for supporting a load in this direction. This here, with all the bolts in a line, supporting a load in this direction is putting a whole lot of force on those things. And it's just not a good idea. I mean, there's a reason why they made a different casting. And on top of that, when they made the different casting, the ribs on this thing, and actually the, the whole wall thickness everywhere, is about 10 millimeters. And here, it's 6 millimeters. You know, there's... Toyota didn't just spend more money on this thing just because. They did it because the strength was a good idea. Now... Yes, this thing will still support your engine. Uh, the safety margin is just a lot lower, so if you hit a big bump or something, this one might crack, whereas this one is designed for that. You want that safety margin. It's there as a safety margin, not as just as a buffer to use. So use this thing. Just get the casting from Toyota. It's not bad. Now, this mount here um, should be going off to production here really soon. Um, it's going to take a little bit, though, because they got to make the tooling for everything, and then they actually have to make a sample run, machine the sample run, send it to me for some testing. Um, yeah, and by the way, I actually don't do, not sure if you noticed, but I don't have manufacturing facilities in this shop. Um, all the parts that I make are all my design, but I use contract manufacturing to actually make them. So uh, this part will be no different. It'll get sent out. So um, it's looking like somewhere, basically the end of 2020 is when I should have actual parts for this thing. And the list that you guys can sign up for, which, by the way, if you haven't signed up, it's in the description. Um, I will send you a notification when this and other parts, but only other parts for this specific swap, are available. Um, the, uh, there's actually 48 of you guys on that list right now. I was never expecting that. I don't make that many sales in a year normally. So uh, I don't know if that means that once I stock this up, it'll sell out instantly or... Uh, if it'll hang on the shelf for a couple of years. I, I really don't know. I hope. hope it sells out right away. I guess, I guess I don't hope it sells out right away. I hope it sells every last one of them, but not one more. That way I don't have to tell one of you guys that I'm out of stock. But we'll see. We'll see. Either way, the parts are getting made. Um, and certainly, if they all sell out or come, even come close to selling out, um, the other bracket here for the AC, uh, I will make that. And I will very likely make an exhaust manifold also. Um, that's just dependent on how well these things and the rest of the parts for this thing sell. So we'll see. Either way. All right. Next thing we got to do, we got to tackle the transmission. That was the whole point of this whole episode here. We're going to remove this and we're going to see you on the bench here in a second. All right. And I scrubbed it just a little bit. Now we need to get inside of it. And because this transmission is covered in this kind of surface rust here, I'll be taking most of it apart so that I can wire brush this stuff clean. And this spring here, there's another one in here that is similar size but not quite actually let me just pull that out right now the other thing by the way this looks like it's got green loctite that's not factory somebody's been inside this transmission so hopefully we're not going to find any horrors in there oh should drain the transmission first all right it's drained now so let's talk about what i wanted to say and by the way, the stuff that came out of there was, uh, uh, looks surprisingly like honey. So I'm starting to wonder what the synchros are going to look like inside here. But what I wanted to say was these two holes, you'll see there's different stiffness of springs. The weaker spring goes on top of the transmission. The stiffer spring goes on the left. Um, it is important to get these in the right spots. If you don't, I believe this will coil bind 
So if you can't shift into some of the rails, you might want to check these. And they have a spring and a ball bearing each. Two more here. And now there's an E-clip underneath here. And I'll show it to you guys in just a minute. Right here. And if it wasn't for the rust here, that would just slide down. But without doing that, you won't be able to take the case off. Okay, now all these bolts around the perimeter here, those all have to come off. Next, the reverse sensor. And there's a bolt right here. This holds a reverse shaft in. Pull that out. And you can see right here, there's tabs and pry bar. That'll help you break the case open. And there it goes. And you want to make sure this shaft is pushed in. And then it should just, there it goes, just come right off. It doesn't have too much debris in here, but see this discoloration here? It's not really inspiring. It's probably fine, but I'm going to spend some time cleaning that for sure. And of course, most of that's going to be brake parts cleaner. Normally, I would only replace this part here, but I want to get rid of all of this stuff all in here. So it's really not that hard to take this stuff apart. First, reverse shaft comes out, reverse idler, reverse fork, and this is the part that we're going to modify. Now the two gear shafts and the shift rails all come up at the same time. Enough of this, let's just cut forward. So yeah, we've got a problem here. That's not turning. This is an open differential, not a limited slip. Hmm. Huh. Let's take a look at the synchros. So this synchro looks, as far as I can tell from here, looks good. And that's first and second. So the second one here is usually what's going to be damaged. These pads are not showing signs of wear. All right, well, this is not where I was planning on ending this episode, but I think somebody killed this transmission by giving it a giant one-wheel burnout, and I'm going to have to figure it out. So if I actually look at the gear teeth on here, these teeth actually, I mean, they're not worn out, but they certainly look to have the most wear of any part of this transmission. Um, and this, I can get it to spin, and after I kind of freed it up with a brass drift there, I can get it to spin by hand and it would probably work, but I don't feel super comfortable with that. Between that and, like if we take a look at these races, let's see, take a look at these races. Um, well, the lighting's not ideal, but you can see, I can't feel that at all with my fingers, but I can see some scratches in there. So I think I want to replace these. Um, I was kind of on the fence about it when I pulled them out. You know, they, they don't look, they really don't look that bad and you can't feel them, but yeah, I think we're going to do that. So 
Um, I'm just going to give everything on the bench here a nice coating of uh, liquid film, uh, just a nice liberal application, and um, then, uh, yeah, I'm going to order some parts. So I'm going to check what the price is on a new differential because, you know, if I look at the... Um, if I look at the synchros on here, the synchros are not even coming close to bottoming out the, the brass. So I, I really don't think this has a ton of miles on it. It's just been, it's been abused in that one condition, right? And that put a bunch of this swarf inside the transmission, but I suspect that was one of the last things that it did. So it probably really didn't grind into the synchros, you know? Just a question of cleaning everything up. Um, gonna put new, bearings well i do have the you know i have the one bearing to replace this that i was already planning on replacing uh because this one is known to go bad and there's no crunchies here at all and i'll get a new one of these actually well yeah you know what for the sake of completeness and the fact that it's really easy to replace i'll get a new one of these i've already got a new one of these i will replace both bearings on the differential. Now, of course, if I replace the differential, you can never really take these, you, you know, you can never really take these off the differential anyway, so those have to be new. And while we're at it, you know, the um, output shaft, we might as well put new bearings on this also. So, yeah, new bearings all the way around. Um, so I guess that means we're gonna have to wait till the next episode to put the transmission back together. I'm sorry about that, guys. But, you know, hopefully the news of the motor mount is good. Um, yeah. Oh, there's actually, there's one more thing I wanna to talk to you guys about. So, and waiting for parts might be the perfect timing. So, let me bring you guys. So this right here is a 1ARFE. Um, I came across a decent deal on it. This is the 2.7 liter version of the 2.5 liter 2ARFE that I've got in my race car. Um, I started building a 2.7 liter version of this motor before uh, COVID hit and things got delayed. Anyways, I still haven't finished up those parts that I need for that, but I was thinking of throwing this in the race car. So not the car that we're working on right now, the white race car that you can see right here. Um, and uh, taking it to the dyno and seeing what kind of horsepower I can make out of it. Um, this is 8% more displacement. So, if we're lucky, we'll get 8% more horsepower, and that should get us into the uh, 220s to the ground. Um, I think it's probably worth doing, and uh, I mean, why not? I think I'm gonna be waiting for parts anyways, and this is this is about a six hour swap anyways, so it'll take longer to get the dyno scheduled and go drive there and take, get that taken care of than it'll do to take this engine in and out of there. So anyways, I think this is probably the next episode you guys are gonna see, and uh, by then, I'll have more parts, and we'll put a finish putting a transmission together, and I will see you guys next video. So, thanks for watching. Bye.